B.V. Ganesh Anandan is the author of the novels Brotherless Night and Love Marriage, which was long listed for the Women's Prize and named one of the best books of the year by the Washington Post. A former vice president of the South Asian Journalists Association, she has also served on the board of the Asian American Writers Workshop and is presently a member of the boards of the American Institute for Sri Lankan Studies and the Minnesota Prison Writing Workshop. The National Endowment for the Arts, the Radcliffe Institute of Advanced Study at Harvard, Yaddo, McDowell, and the American Academy in Berlin have all awarded her fellowships. She served as visiting faculty at the Helen Zell Writers Program at the University of Michigan and at the Iowa Writers Workshop, and now teaches in the MFA program at the University of Minnesota, where she is a McKnight Presidential Fellow and Associate Professor of English. She co-hosts the fiction nonfiction podcast on Literary Hub, which is about the intersection of literature and the news. Mira Jacob is a novelist, memoirist, illustrator, and cultural critic. Her graphic memoir, Good Talk, a memoir in conversations, was shortlisted for the National Book Critics, Cir Critics Circle Award, nominated for three Eisner Awards, long listed for the Penn Open Book Award, and named a New York Times Notable Book, as well as Best Book of the Year by Times, Esquire, Publishers Weekly, and Library Journal. It is currently in development as a television series. Her novel, The Sleepwalker's Guide to Dancing, was a Barnes & Noble Discover New Writer's Pick, shortlisted for India's Tata First Literature Award, longlisted for the Brooklyn Literary Eagles Prize, and named one of the best books of 2014 by Kirkus Reviews, The Boston Globe, Goodread, Bustle, and The Millions. She is an assistant professor at the writing program at the New School and a founding member, faculty member of the MFA program at Randolph College. She is the co-founder of Pete's Reading Series in Brooklyn, where she spent 13 years bringing literary fiction, nonfiction, and poetry to Williamsburg. She lives in Brooklyn with her husband, documentary filmmaker Jed Rothstein, and their son. And now I would like to welcome Vivi on screen to read from her book. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining this webinar this evening. Um, I'm Vivi Ganesh Anandan, also known as Sugi. A quick image description of me. I'm a South Asian woman with short black hair um, that's about to my shoulder, and I'm wearing a red v-neck sweater. Um, so it's a great pleasure for me to be here in part because one of my first jobs in New York City, maybe my first job in New York City, was at the Asian American Writers Workshop where I taught journalism to high school girls um, pretty much right when I moved to New York City back in 2006. And it's an organization that's very dear to me, so I really appreciate them hosting this event. So thanks to Vandana and the staff, and also to my friend Mira Jacob, who hosted me long ago at Pete's Reading Series, and it's a joy to be in a webinar with her. Um, so I'm going to start the conversation by reading a little bit from Brotherless Night, um, just the basically the first few opening pages. It's a novel that's in the first person. And it is told from the point of view of New York in 2009, which is the year that the Sri Lankan Civil War ended. Um, and she is recalling her teenage years, starting in 1981, and kind of going forward for the first several years of the war. So it begins with a prologue that is in 2009. I recently sent a letter to a terrorist I used to know. He lives near me, here in New York City, and when I opened the envelope and slid in the note that said, I would like to come and see you, I thought of how much he had always required of me and how little I had ever asked of him. Even when I was growing up in Sri Lanka, before I had ever heard the word terrorist, I knew that if a certain kind of person wanted something done, I should comply without asking too many questions. I met a lot of these sorts of people when I was younger because I used to be what you would call a terrorist myself. We were civilians first. You must understand that word terrorist is too simple for the history we have lived, too simple for me, too simple even for this man. How could one word be enough? But I'm going to say it anyway because it is the language you know and it will help you to understand who we were, what we were called, and who we have truly become. We begin with this word, but I promise that you will come to see that it cannot contain everything that has happened. Someday, the story will begin with the word civilian, the word home. 
And while I am no longer the version of myself who met with terrorists every day, I also want you to understand that when I was that woman, when two terrorists encountered each other in my world, what they said first was simply hello, like any two people you might know or love. Part one, a near invisible scar. Chapter one, the boys with the Jaffna eyes. Jaffna, 1981. I met the first terrorist I knew when he was deciding to become one. Kay and his family lived down the road from me and mine in one village of the Tamil town called Jaffna in Sri Lanka. The Jaffna Peninsula is the northernmost part of the country. Many people have died there, some killed by the Sri Lankan army and the state, some by the Indian peacekeeping force, and some by the Tamil separatists, whom you know as the terrorists. Many people, of course, have also lived. In early 1981, I was almost 16 years old. I already wanted to become a doctor like my grandfather, and I had recently begun attending my brother's school, where girls my age were accepted for advanced level studies. In those days, I thought mostly about the university entrance exams. K, too, dreamed of medical school. And this was what made us alike, long before K chose the movement, long before I treated patients in a New York City emergency room, long before we became so different. K had the upper hand from the first, not because he was one year older or a boy, but because I was his patient. Our meeting was both gruesome and fortunate for me. On the day that we met, I was boiling water for tea. I had to use a piece of cloth to hold the pot's metal handle. But that morning, the cloth slipped, the handle slipped, and the pot slipped, pouring scalding water all over me. I screamed and screamed for my mother, Amma. My shrill voice carried out onto the road where Kay was passing. Letting his bicycle fall in the dirt at our gate, he ran inside. By the time he reached me in the kitchen at the back of the house, Amma had already found me. As bubbles rose and popped on my skin, I shut my eyes, but I could hear her sobbing and the sounds of pots and pans clattering to the floor. With every clang, heat flared around and inside me. Under my skin, another skin burned. I cried and called for Murahan, Pelayar, Shiva. Sashi, he said, and I opened my eyes to his face without recognizing it. Sit, he said, and pointed to a chair. When I kept screaming, but did not move, he grabbed my hands, pushed me down into the chair and peeled my blouse up, bearing my scorched stomach. I heard Amma's ayo beside me as though she were speaking from a great distance. Snatching a bowl of eggs off the table, Kay began cracking them onto the wounds. I have to fetch water, Amma said, clutching a pan she tried to move past him. But he put his shoulders between her and the doorway this will cool the burn, he said. She stood there uselessly. I stared at him, trying to focus on anything but the pain, and saw only his thumbs working in and out of the eggshells, scraping the slime of the whites cleanly onto the swelling rawness. He did it very swiftly, as though he had had a lot of practice, as though every scrap of egg was precious. My skin was so hot that even now when I remember those quick and clever hands, and the slippery shock of relief. I cannot quite believe that the eggs did not just cook on my flesh. When the last one was cracked and steaming on my skin, Kay looked up at Amma. Are there more? She did not respond, still stunned. More eggs, he said. She blinked, then nodded. Good, keep covering the burn. I'll go for the doctor. When Kay returned with the physician half an hour later, the older man looked over the makeshift dressing with approval. It should heal, he said. You may not even have a scar. My own mother used to crack eggs onto burns. This is not the sort of medicine they teach in school. Whose idea was it? Kay glanced at me without saying anything. I crackled inside still. I didn't know what to do, Amma said softly. His idea, I said. So I began as Kay's patient, though he ended as mine. I'll stop there. Thank you.
Amazing. Hey, Sugi. Hi. Hi. Those gorgeous. I'm good. Thank you. That's amazing. It was so good to hear it in your voice. And also, um, I didn't, I, you know, when this book came out, I need to tell you that um, Naomi, you know, Naomi Winamira, um, she sure. wrote on our, we have a, we have a group text chain and she said, so he did the thing. She did the thing. Um, meaning like this incredible book um, and this incredible story. And she was so just delighted and when you were reading i felt that again as you were reading i was like oh you really did the thing this is just so thank you beautiful and nuanced and i'm sorry to go on but i'm so excited i have my copy here everyone should be getting their copy right now um i have so many questions for you about this book but i think what i every scene it's so funny because as you read that scene i was like oh i remember that scene like it was in my own body but then i realized i remembered a lot of your scenes that way and i'm so curious which you started with like what was the scene that started this enormous sweeping gorgeous novel thank you so much um i started the novel with a little bit of research about a hunger strike that took place in Sri Lanka in the late 1980s. And a scene that came from that research is later in the book. And then the scene that I just read followed very soon after that. So um, some pieces of this book have been in place for a really long time. Mm -hmm. uh, and then other pieces took a lot, took a lot longer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This was the, your last book came out in 2008, yeah? Yes. So this was, so you're working on this. Um, I, I believe you're working on this for most of that time. Is that right? And a little bit before. I started it in 2004. I feel like I remember talking to you about this um, back then. But I'm curious because, because it is so large in scope, and yet you kind of dial it down to these beautiful, really telling scenes. Did you always know where you were headed with this, or did it evolve as you were writing? Um, it definitely changed as I was writing it. It because I started it in 2004 and that prologue, I wrote it before 2004 mm. and yet it's dateline is 2009. So the way that time moved after I started the book certainly shifted how I wrote it. And it also just, I mean, it had, there were hundreds of pages that were in here that I threw away. Yeah. So um, God knows where they should go, but um, <laughs> somewhere in the other, in the somewhere, other place. Yeah. Somewhere. Yeah. In somewhere in another direction. book that has, it has, it has, that book has a lot more about New York in it. And I ended up cutting, cutting a lot of New York related things in it. Um, so yeah, it definitely took different forms and lost some characters and yeah. So I love, I, I love hearing that, by the way, I feel like as writers, it's always so comforting to hear that because you get, you get something like this and it seems so um, sort of perfectly wrought. And so I love to know that there were parts that came and parts that went and parts that evolved. It's very, it's very comforting, frankly, for process to know that something can can go through iterations. Um, and specifically, you just said something that actually, so you said this, the prologue has been written since 2004, is that right? Definitely, yeah, probably sometime in 2004. Okay, that's amazing. Also, because you do start with I mean, right away from that first sentence, um, the intimacy with the terrorist, right? I recently sent a letter to a terrorist and then you unpack the word terrorist. So right there, you are immediately starting with this idea. And I imagine in 2004, where were you living in 2004? In Iowa City. Yeah. So I imagine the word terrorist had a specific intent around you at that moment, no? Sure. I think that when I wrote it, it was a very post 9-11 page. Yeah. Um, but I also come from a community that has been subjected to that discourse for much yeah. longer. Yeah. Um, and so I had heard that sort of language bandied around in relation to my community for much, yeah, for a much longer period of time. And of sort of watching other people start to use it uh, and use it for a broader and broader group of people. Um, and yeah, I think there were definitely moments sort of later in working on it when I thought, um, I looked back at it and remembered that I had kind of written it in the shadow of 9-11, but it, because my familiarity with that discourse preceded 9-11 by quite a lot. And yeah. I was regrettably sure that it would go past that. 
Go and ahead. here we are. <laughs> Here we are. Um, no, it's just really interesting because when you said that, I was thinking like, oh, because it's right away, it's interrupting. It's interrupting that word right away, right? That's what it does. The, that prologue immediately puts you on the other side of that word and says, I'm going to tell you this word and then when I'm going to untwist that word for you so that you have to see the humanity in it, which is so much of what um, this book does, right? It puts us on the other side and the other side and the other side, the many I feel like there was something that was happening to me when I was reading this and there was a real sure footedness in this that I found really astonishing. And one of the things that I kept thinking about was, I feel, and maybe you don't feel this, so I'll just say, I feel sometimes when I'm writing things coming from the diaspora, there are so many times where I really have to situate myself to, to feel my right to tell a story, right? Like, what is my right to tell this? with my, what is my proximity to it and what is my right? And I didn't feel that wavering in here. And I'm curious if there was ever that feeling in you or if you went right into this knowing what your positionality was and how you were gonna tell it. That's a great question. Um, I wrote a little bit about this for Literary Hub, which helped me to think through kind of how I had done it. And I mean, certainly I am a diasporic writer and the place I'm writing from is different than someone who's writing from inside Sri Lanka or someone who's writing from elsewhere in the diaspora, mm -hmm. um, someone who's emigrated at a different point in their life. And I think I was uncomfortable with the sort of automatic authority that some people would accord me as a member of the diaspora. They would assume that I knew what I was talking about or might even chop off the American part of my identity and just refer to me as Sri Lankan. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't actually ever identify as Sri Lankan without also identifying as Tamil and also identifying as American. Um, that's something that I have intentionally resisted. Mm -hmm. uh, so I was uncomfortable with the extra authority, but I was also uncomfortable with the idea that I should not write about it because I didn't, that I didn't have the standing. So it seemed to me like there might be maybe a way to earn the standing or at least standing with myself. So this was sort of what was behind a pretty like obsessive research drive that took a really okay. long time. Well, let's and talk was very about messy. Yeah, yeah, let's talk about let's talk about the research drive. Um, specifically, I mean, one of the things because you're talking about um, how do I say this? So I guess one of the things I mean we've talked about this before um, with your last book. We talked about the the uh, uncle in the audience that would like to get up after every time you read and then tell you all the things you got wrong, right? There's always that guy who's like, let me tell you all the things you got wrong. Um, it's amazing because he just seems to know everything. But um, but we talked about that person that does that. And also in the ter in terms of what right do I have to tell a story? There's also first there's the research, which I want to hear about. But I'm also really curious because this is an incredible act of imagination, too. And I think of in certain ways. I think of imagination as um, a willingness to breathe into something and to look for the nuance and the truth beyond just the facts, right? I mean, that's what imagination does. It takes some of the facts, but it breathes a kind of life into it. And I'm so curious because this required such a nimble imagination as well. How did you give yourself permission to do that? Um, I think maybe also spending a lot of time on it made that more possible. Um, I had plenty of time, or at least I took plenty of time to um, find my way into the spaces between the facts that were available mm -hmm. to um, decide which facts were the ones that meant the most to me and to think about how individual people might have fit into, like, say, large pieces of history, right? And I had yeah. thought of myself, I think, um, Love Marriage has a plot, but it's not like the plottiest book. Okay. And there were, and there were early drafts of love marriage where, um, it became like very clear that one of the things it needed was more plot. And so I had for a long time kind of thought of myself as a writer who wasn't, wasn't a, I wasn't a writer of plot, but oh. then also whenever I talked to anyone about the Sri Lanka civil war, it's very clear that everything that happened was, it was full of plot. So, um, you know, people's individual lives, like just tons of things had happened to them. Mm -hmm. So, um, that was something that I wanted to represent and that um, seemed doable and interesting 
but also like a challenge for my particular set of skills. Yeah. Uh, so it was, it was interesting to learn how to do that. Um, and that involved like a lot of kind of nitty gritty things, like doing a lot of math to figure out when all of the characters were born and like what year would they enter, which kind of school and would their educations be interrupted and when, and, um, you know, what would medical school exams be like in this year versus that year? And what year did this event happen? And where might the characters have been? And could they reasonably have intersected with it? Um, or would it seem like they were turning into Sri Lankan Forest Gump and appearing at like every, <laughs> every large historical event in a convenient way, right? It had to seem huh? organic. Um, that's yeah. an incredible amount of yeah I mean okay so you're plotting you're plotting like that and you're I'm assuming you're doing just a ton of research I did do a lot of research um it would have behooved me to be more organized about it earlier but okay tell me about really... that what was the why well, what was happening with your initial research well I think I didn't really comprehend the scope of what I had taken on and so I didn't have a system I just had um a lot of scattered information and okay, wait, it, wait, I'm sorry, can we back up real quick? When you say you didn't know what you'd taken on, what did your mind had you taken on? Like, do you know what I'm saying? When you started, were you like, I'm gonna write this thing and it's gonna look like this. What was the this? I'm not sure I knew. <laughs> um, I really That's like, um, no, I think, it's, I think it's great when questions like presume like a huge amount of confidence. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm I like, yes, really that's well what happened. <laughs> I hate people that don't try hard and they're like, it happened. Oh, it's amazing. No, no, no. I, no, I totally, I totally tried. I tried. It just, I, um, I yeah. yeah, no, no, no. I, I, um, by no means was it effortless, but it was certainly, it was, it was messy. Um, so if it, if it appears organized now, that was with a lot of like careful vacuuming in the later stages. Um, okay. so yeah, I think, you know, I, I didn't use anything like Scrivener for example, which is um, for those who might not know, like a, a particular kind of software for book writers that allows you to kind of pin your research in certain ways and move things around very easily. I didn't use that. Um, that might've helped me. Uh, I I just have a lot of, I have a lot of Microsoft Word files named like, you might need this later, dot, dot. Um, <laughs> it's so great. Cause they tell you, that tells you exactly what's in them. <laughs> yeah, it's really, it's, as a search term, it's super handy. <laughs> Um, so I guess the thing is too, is when you're, so you're also, you are, you're wandering into something by, that by nature, by nature of a civil war, people are not agreeing on what any of the truth is, right? So even when you're researching, everything has, everyone has a subjectivity, everything, you know, there's a, there's a take on a take. How did you sort through that? How did you, like, how do you walk through something like that and decide this is what I'm going to use for the story and this is what I'm going to believe for the purposes of this character in the story? Um, that's a great question. I think kind of going back to your question of what did I think this was, right? Yeah. It's sort of the, the story begins in 1981 and there's of course a major historical event in 1981, which is the burning of the Jaffna Public Library, which does appear in this novel and appears pretty early. And the story of the burning of that library is told in a number of different ways. And I had heard a version of it growing up and I had read about a version of it. And then I had read versions that contradicted that, that seemed to me very obviously um, not sound. And then I sort of had to think about why did they not seem sound to me? And what did that, what did that mean? Um, and where were the most, how could I take those accounts and kind of hold them up against each other? What did they look like? when I compared them, right? So none of them were kind of, I didn't look at any one of them alone. Like by, mm -hmm. none of them, none of them kind of took center stage until I compared them and then kind of thought about which parts were the parts that I believed. Um, and then at the other end, that bit of research that I found the hunger strike, there's also different ways that that story is told. And so I guess when I think about what did I think this story was, I did know that it went from just about 1981 to just about um, at least like 1989 or 1990. I had that kind of rough framework and then I wasn't sure how much farther I might go. Um, but I did, I spent a lot of time in university libraries. I spent a lot of time comparing memoirs from people who were parts of different um, different stakeholders in the war, whether those were, there were, there were a ton of memoirs by Indian army officers 
who were in Sri Lanka during that period, um, they're not oh. great. Um, <laughs> like they're not riveting or the, or is it, is it told in a really dry way? They're some of them. So yeah. yes, some of them are, are interestingly bent on, um, yeah, like a certain narrative of heroism and some of, I mean, some of them are better written than others, of course, but I mean, there were just a ton of them. Um, and, you know, so you can, you can go find those in a university library and like, how does this one stack up next to this one? This one totally leaves out that incident, et cetera. Um, and so, and then I would also, of course, talk to people who would say all sorts of things that were not in the books. So, um, yes. it was a lot of triangulating, a lot of triangulating and oh, thinking yeah. about because, I mean, it was very hard to find anything that even purported to be an objective take. Yeah. Sure. No, that completely makes sense. Um, I'm wondering if we can talk about the characters for a minute. So we, when we meet this family, um, when we meet Sashi's family, we are seeing it through, right? We've got Sashi sort of telling us what is um, happening and and then we know we meet the brothers and and because of the haunting title of the book, we know that terrible things are afoot. I'm so curious why you told it through her. I think her voice was the voice that presented itself um, because I wrote that hunger strike first and I didn't write it from the point of view of the hunger striker. I wrote it from the point of view of someone watching the hunger striker who was her. Um, mm -hmm. And I knew that I wanted to be a novel about civilian women. And so she was, it was easy to stick with her. She's also, um, as you can tell from the opening, like quite insistent and bossy. So she kind of just, and, and like a little cranky in a way that I was like, great, I support this crankiness. Um, no, she's, <laughs> she's, irritated, she's irritated at the way that, um, that things have been described and she's going to give you her description and you're going to sit down and listen to it. Um, so she just had, um, she had a voice that was easy to follow. And can you tell us a bit about the brothers, about what you, like, cause sure. each one sort of represent, I mean, I feel like each one sort of brings something specific um, about the war into focus, right? They, they, they kind of bring something to us that tells us something specific. Can you tell us just for people who haven't read yet, I just want to give them a sure. little idea of what they're going to turn. Sure, so um, early on, I had written a section of the book where she referred to her brothers and referred to that having had four brothers and them all dying. I haven't said spoiler alert because that's not what happens. I revised and, um, but that did give me a family with four brothers. And that was an idea I was interested in. Um, Love Marriage had originally had a brother character in it and I had taken him out ruthlessly because he kept taking over everything. Um, oh. And I was like, I was like, buddy, you're gone. Um, and so, <laughs> um, and so, so in this, yeah, I think, and in, so in this case, it was interesting and sort of a surprise to me to populate the book with like these boys who mm -hmm. get along pretty well with each other, despite their significant differences in personality and, um, and their one sister. So, you know, she has, specific political conversations with basically all of them um, okay. about different subjects and, and they have different things that they want to be when they grow up and, um, you know, different ambitions and hobbies and, and they're funny. Uh, and yes, uh, they, they have, they have kind of a rough go, the four of them. And they're, and they're all in this, in this stage of life where there are some, there's something they want to be when they grow up and the presumption is they will grow up, right? There's always there's this there, there's something that they all want to be and she in particular wants to be a doctor yeah yeah and can you tell us a little bit about um what would you say her what would you say her politics are as the story evolves you don't have to tell us the end to the end but like how does she evolve as a character sure so she kind of begins the novel um idolizing her late grandfather, who she knows was someone who kind of provided um, care specifically for women in Colombo before he passed away. So she's aware that she comes from like this lineage of, I don't think, I don't think she would necessarily say my grandfather was a feminist, but she kind of, that's the idea that she has. Um, mm. And 
she also believes, I think she's, you know, she's interested in medicine for the reasons that many people are. It's like a stable career, it's prestigious, but also just she, she finds the science of it interesting. She finds medicine interesting and she enjoys it. And she also believes that it's something that people should have access to. So one set of her politics is just that she thinks that everyone should have healthcare um, and that that's mm -hmm. true regardless of their stakes in what is going on. And as Crazy the conflict, yeah. <laughs> as the conflict goes on, mm -hmm. yeah, as the conflict goes on, she finds herself in different um, and challenging positions for that reason. She, she tries to get into medical school um, and she eventually succeeds. But as that is happening, the war is kind of taking off, um, which means that her education is interrupted in, in mm -hmm. different ways. And also that she finds an education in informal spaces in a way that she didn't anticipate. Yeah. And, and so there are, there are parts of this, like, for example, um, the clinic, can we talk about the clinic for a little bit? Sure. Like, um, like so, yeah, go ahead. so she, um, one thing that happens to her is that she works in a field clinic for the tigers, um, or a field clinic that's run by the tigers. And she's sort of invited to, she's someone who has a talent for this, um, an aptitude and, and, um, and they need, they need hands, they need people. Um, so they ask if she would like to help and she does. And so she finds herself treating potters and civilians, um, and also trying to go to medical school at the same time. And, um, and this is like a, a kind of grueling, a grueling set of tasks to, to put yourself to. And, and she's operating in not great conditions. And, but she's also learning to kind of do the things she loves to do with the things that are available. Um, and so she has medical school life and she kind of has secret field hospital life which some of her friends and family know about and, and others don't. So it becomes a kind of a divide in her world and also in her head. Um, and then she has to figure out, eventually she has, she has some questions where she has to figure out kind of how to reconcile those two things, um, what's happening in the field hospital and what's happening beyond it, what the Tigers and the IPKF and Sri Lankan security forces are doing, what the militarization of Jaffna is doing to civilians. Mm -hmm. And she doesn't, it, it... I, I feel like she doesn't go into it with um, a burning thought of this is where I stand in this and this is what I think and this is very clear to me. It feels yeah. to me that she evolves, right? She evolves and it's kind of she's kind of peeking around certain corners at a certain, you know, and getting, as you say, like she's got that great characteristic of being um, irritated and, and wanting to kind of get it right, wanting to tell the details in a certain way. But there's something also there where I feel like um, the way that you have written her is so interesting because she doesn't have a hard take. She doesn't have a stance where she's saying this is right and this is wrong. No, I think that, um, right, one of the things is that the story is in retrospective point of view. So she is older and kind of judging herself as a teenager. So sometimes the older self has an opinion about what happened at the time. but she can be pretty gentle with, um, with the younger version of herself and sort of see, you know, at the time I didn't know this, I didn't know that. And so I made this choice and maybe today I wouldn't have done that. Um, and yeah, so I think um, she definitely, she doesn't excuse things that she thinks are wrong. She's, she is judgy, mm -hmm. but you couldn't necessarily pin her down um and so I was yeah I was having a conversation with like a bunch of people connected to medicine who were asking me about this and talking about the difference between like right when you're a doctor and you're treating a patient the patient is supposed to be no one the patient is anyone right the patient is a body and um and then yet in politics she's trying to avoid a kind of moral relativism she does want to have an opinion and I think that those things are sometimes at odds for her. I mean, it's such an incredible character choice too, because it does allow her to make the mistakes that she needs to make or that, you know, go through the world with the, with the level of sort of figuring it out as she goes while also holding this idea of, I'm also seeing the future and I'm holding the, the sort of the pain of the future in the same moment that I'm holding how I had to move through it. 
you know, it like gives us this, it gives us sort of the full, the breadth and the dimension. The other thing that it, that I kept thinking as this was going on, and I feel like I kept thinking as books like this often make me think, like, what do you do? How do you stay safe when this is happening? What, what decision can you make? Where, what are the smart decisions? There are no smart decisions, right? There's just this sort of careful trying to understand what is happening and reassessing and reassessing. Um, but there aren't, I didn't feel like there was a, there's one clear path through this where it felt like if you'd only done that, there's regrets, but nothing is so clear in the moment. I think you did a really beautiful job of, to me, pulling that out. Um, I'm curious also about the brothers. Can you tell us a little bit about them? Because they're also, they have their flavors. <laughs> uh, sure, there's four of them. The oldest is Naranjan. Um, the second one is Dialin. Uh, the third one is Seelin, and then the one who's younger than Sashi is Aaron. And Niranjan um, is in medical school when the book begins, and he's the oldest and kind of most reliable brother, um, and the one who they all kind of adore. And then the second one, Dylan, wants to be an engineer, but um, is sort of a sneaky reader and likes to likes to read novels and is very quiet and kind of looks like their dad. And then the third brother is kind of the popular, the popular brother at school. And um, like, he's a little bit flashy, a little bit hot-tempered. Um, and he and Sashi are only a year apart and they don't exactly get along. Um, she's least close to him. And then her littlest brother um, is kind of a talker and wants to be, maybe he's, he's kind of like, maybe I should go into law. Then I could talk as much as I wanted. And he's always like <laughs> reading the newspaper and yeah, and they're like a funny bunch of bunch of um, boys, and they you know they stand around on their lane playing cricket and giving each other grief. And their friend down the road is Hay, who appeared in the scene that I read. Um, and so he's often with the four of them. Um, and yeah, in some ways, he's kind of yeah, he's he's the person who moves with them wherever yeah. wherever they go. Yeah, I mean, and I think um, I'm I'm sorry to make you recount that just just so flatly, but I feel like one of the things that um, I really enjoyed about this is, you know, and I think I keep reading this also, by the way, in um, reviews, people talk about the level of nuance. And when I was reading, I was just thinking just it, for me, it was sort of a master stroke to have that pantheon of characters so you could get that level of nuance in. I feel like there were so many different ways that you could bleed it through the book um, and through kind of turning, um, kind of turning toward the characters to reveal, you know, um, decisions that are hard to make or decisions that are done willingly with great hope and, you know, and a kind of selective blindness that that feeling and watching this family, I think, and, and wanting so much um, wanting so much for for the protection of them um, is it just sort of propels us in this way. It was very funny to me when you said you weren't a plotter before, because I when I was reading this, it felt it. This feels very, very plot, plot, plot to me. No, it's pretty plotty. It's pretty plotty. Yeah. <laughs> yes, there's um, there's always a thing like, happening. There's always a thing happening. And it felt like the engine was on and we were like going. Um, I'm always curious when when you're writing a book like this, is there, I sometimes feel like you you write and then you get to like, there's usually like one, maybe but for me, maybe there's like one moment at which I feel like I'm sort of deeply in writing the thing I most needed to write. And there's a kind of joy in that, even if it's not, even if it's not a happy thing, even if it's not, um, if it's not something someone else would look at from the outside and say, she seemed like she was having some joy writing that. There's something that I was writing for that really unearths in that. Did you feel like that was happening for you at a certain point in this book? Do you know what I mean? There, there are all sorts of beautiful points, but was there a point where you really felt like you were writing the exact thing that you're supposed to be writing? That's interesting. I think I felt that probably several times because I took so long. <laughs> <laughs> the, the answer is stretch it all out. No, um, I think yeah. There, there were several. There were several moments that were um, really fun to write. Is not a, well. Sometimes it was. I mean, so there is like, for example, a group of university students who discuss um, a feminist text, feminism and nationalism in the third world, 
which some of us know and love. Um, and it is, yeah, I mean, it's a classic. It also, to anyone who hasn't heard of it and maybe isn't in academia, like the title of it might sound a little dry. And I was kind of like, can I write a really fun scene involving feminism and nationalism in the third world? And that was that was really fun to write. Um, and also just to have this, you know, it was like, it's a bunch of women having a conversation and, and kind of like a like an argument about a book that they care about and they're friends with each other and they're all different and um you know and they're all they're all thumble women and that yeah and they and but they also come from different parts of the community like they come from different ranks at the university they have different class backgrounds different caste backgrounds um and that conversation yeah that conversation was um was a joy and then yeah i think like that there was a are delicious conversation to read yeah <laughs> it's really, just really there's fun. just there's just yeah it's um certainly as someone who has been teaching at a university for a while I was like oh this feels familiar um so yeah I, I hadn't anticipated writing classroom scenes and then there are also a lot of scenes related to medicine that were huge fun to write um Sashi has problems dissecting animals um and she sort of starts out feeling very scared of it and so I got to describe all these dissections and that was, yeah, learning about the dissections was fun and kind of the tests that people had to pass um, and just describing like the kind of just the sheer nerdery of that was great. Um, like how many, <laughs> how many, how many cockroaches are you allowed? Um, you know, and, and is yeah. that, that, so this is a way your teacher can be strict with you and, <laughs> and describe, describing the teachers was also really fun. Oh Yeah. Oh my God. Yes. Like a lot of, a lot of catharsis and they're tiny little, little things happening. Um, we do have, okay. I just wanted to say, um, we do have the questions over and I will ask the ones that come in. There is a question that I was going to ask you later. Can you speak to the craft choice of using the first person as well as the second person speaking directly to the reader? Um, it's a very powerful craft choice. Can you talk about that a little bit? Um, sure. Thanks for the question. Um, so I did write that page that I, the page that I read first was one of the earlier pages that I had written. Um, and that was the first page on which the U kind of presented itself. And that was a gift of my composing subconscious, for which I'm grateful. And I feel like one of the things that one does in revision or continuation in a long project is to find the things that are like the happy accidents of your subconscious and the composition and to kind of say, I could repeat that on purpose. And why might I have done that? And like, what use is it to me? And that you um, presents itself in the book a few times. And I think I'm interested in, I have been interested for a long time in kind of questions of audience, right? Um, there's a presumption, for example, that I am able to explain the entire Sri Lankan civil war and that I should. And that also that I have to, that there is no way to get out of that. Um, and that's one of the many things that she's crabby about. And the direct address to the reader kind of allows her the space to be kind of annoyed about that. Um, annoyed isn't not exactly even the right word, but she's just kind of like, what world is this? Where, you know, you're gonna sit there and I'm gonna sit here and you expect me to explain. And I think that was probably the result of my having been expected to explain a lot um, and being probably, you know, both getting better at it and also getting really tired of doing it. Um, and also it's so recognizing, yeah. Sorry, what? well, I also, I also, yeah, well, I mean, I just also live in a world in which, I mean, and I'm sure you're familiar with this too, like, you know, where, where is this particular state in India and like, what is what are the different communities that live there? And all of a sudden you're like, I'm a Wikipedia entry. Um, and um, so you find yourself, but but it's also true that like, in order to write about this particular subject, you did like, maybe you made yourself into a kind of expert. So I was interested also, yeah, in that, in that question of explanation, who is assumed to owe the explanation and to whom are they, to whom are they expected to give it? Like who is the presumed narrator and audience? And, and I think I just figured that also quite often people don't think that someone like me is the narrator and they also don't think I'm the audience. So I just felt like I had seen a lot of kind of headlines that would say things like, you've never seen a blank like blank. And 
sometimes I would have seen a blank like blank. I was like, <laughs> me, I'm I'm here too. I'm also the audience. I saw the I, I saw the thing. I saw the thing that you find so astonishing. Um, I've seen it several times, right? It's like those, I don't know. It's like those food reviews that kind of Columbus a particular cuisine. Yes, yes. Uh-huh. So yeah, so, but then I think as a narrator, the you also gives her an opportunity to, so to, to acknowledge those moments where she might be assuming things about her audience, right? Because a lot of t- the time when I get asked questions about writing about Sri Lanka, people are sort of asking questions like, who is your audience? And which mm-hmm. is, can be code for kind of, are you writing for non-Sri Lankans? And what was that like for you? Like, do you feel like, and the subtext, there could practically be a subtitle that says, are you a sellout? And, uh, um, and, you know, or, you know, could you talk to me is the other, is the other subtitle of that. Like, could you talk to me? And so like the you is kind of a, like a chance to, to talk to someone specifically and be like, you, I see you. I see you personally, yeah. maybe, maybe your library got burned down. Maybe you. Did that feel kind of amazing and cathartic to write it? There's some really angry lines in there. I know, <laughs> really I fun. know. I mean, they, I mean, that's why I'm asking because 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 in the in the reading, I was like, that must have been a fun one to lay down, you know, just the the little the the bloodletting that happens under. Um, yeah. Okay. I wanted to ask you about. Um, I know we talked a little bit about the parts of this that were a joy for you. And I'm sorry to ask this, but I do feel like when when something comes out this this beautifully, you have to tell us, were there parts that were really, I know it took a while, but were there parts of the craft that you struggled with in the course of this? Oh gosh, were there parts of the craft that I didn't struggle with? I mean, it doesn't um, feel like you struggled with much, but go on. <laughs> um, I think I referred to my like uh, horrendous disorganization you did um, that. Okay, we got this organization. So we'll, 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 we'll bypass that one. But um, I think time was a challenge. The book is mm-hmm. now told basically in order with some specific exceptions um, okay. that have to do with certain kind of ruptures, certain events that are ruptures. But other than that, it's very much in order. And when it was out of order, it was, I think, because I was trying to avoid doing that story math that I described earlier and oh. trying to avoid kind of cause and effect. I would sort of have a lot of characters alluding to, I would, I would always be alluding to like how the, t- the terrible thing that would happen to them later, but they didn't know yet, or the terrible thing that had happened to them years ago and they were all standing around thinking about it, but no one was saying a word. And this is all also of <laughs> course connected to plotlessness, right? Yeah. Um, so I think I had to kind of like decide I was gonna go and see all the terrible things. And I had a friend, um, and I can't recommend her book highly enough, uh, Leslie Arima, who wrote What It Means When a Man Falls from the Sky. And Leslie kind of very Mm -hmm. gently, she read an early draft and she kind of said to me, have you considered telling this story in order? And I was like, wild. (laughs) I mean, it's the most, it's like, she said it so kindly. um, And she was completely (laughs) correct. So, you know, I was like, I should, I'm always going to listen to her. I mean, it's also really, it's such a, it's such an interesting tell in a way, right? Where you're like, but if I do that, then I have to do the thing where I write down the dates and I know exactly when things are happening. And I can't just hint at the bewildering thing on the other side of this, right? Like I have to, Mm -hmm. I have to be like, no, it was this thing. It happened on this day. It looked like that. And this is this many days later and they feel exactly like this, right? The specificity. Yeah. I thought I had yeah. Yeah, just know I had to, yeah, I had to write down what days their birthdays were. <laughs> That's like, <laughs> the insult of that. Um, no, but you know what, it's so funny because when you were talking earlier about um, about when you have to get good at something that you can't stand doing, which I feel like that's, I do that a lot. Um, you know, when people ask you to explain yourself, you get very good at doing something you can't stand doing. But this other work that you're talking about, the learning how to write down the date and find the cause and effect and generate it through the plot, that to me is actually, that's kind of, that is kind of joyful to me, no? Now it is. Now it is? Now Now that you see that it works, you're like, I'll do it again. Yeah, I think now now I know my scales so I can play the music. Okay, I got you. 
I got you. Is there, if there was one thing, I know we're going to, I don't, we're going to run out of time shortly, but if there was one thing you could tell, I always think this, okay, this is, I seriously talk to the person that starts the books half the time, like now in the future, I still talk to the people that started the books I did. If you could tell the one thing to the you that was starting this book, like a piece of advice to the you that was starting the book about what this process was going to take from you and what you would need going forward, what would you tell that person? Um, I know, I know, but I got to ask, I do. There's only asking six minutes. For um, asking for a me. <laughs> well, I think I would sort of, I would try to get myself to certain decisions faster, yeah. um, compress the waffling a little. Mm. Um, Wait, hold on. Let's stop there real quick. I need to stop there. Compress the waffling. Tell me. Like, unpack that a time? yeah, like, um, should the brothers die or not die? Um, which brothers should die? Um, you know, like, I don't know, which, which characters will be where and when, like, which will, will I put in this big event? You know, should I tell the story in order? Like all of the, I don't know, like I, it's hard to just sort of go back in time and yell at yourself, decide faster. Yeah. Um, but I think, yeah, like sort of getting myself to that story math faster because it's not easy to do and you can make an error and then have to go back and fix it, which is horrible. Um, so if I just had sort of reconcile <laughs> at least once, um, you know, and so like I, if I had, if I could have reconciled myself to doing that math a little earlier, that would have been productive. I mean, also, can we talk about the difference um, between making a decision and then having to go back and fix the story math versus not making the decision at all? Yeah. Right? There's the like the waffling, right? There's the waffling, but then there's the having to fix the story math. What would you rather be stuck with? Fixing the story math. Right? I mean, I, I often face this too, but I, but I just needed you to say it out loud. Um, okay. In going back to the research, we do have another um, uh, question. In going back to the research, did you do it consistently or in batches slash small stretches of time? Um, did I do it consistently or in small stretches of time? I guess, again, I wrote the book over such a long period of time that it was really both. So there were stretches where I was doing mostly research and then later as I was revising, I was sometimes doing research for specific revisions. And I was also fortunate to have people who had lived through this time period reading drafts for me. Okay, so mm -hmm. um, yeah, there was one person in particular who I was had a, when I was writing the book in order, I went back and kind of started over again and was writing it in order. And I would send her a chapter every day, but if I didn't send her a chapter, she would scold me, which was great. You had a um, scolder. Oh, we all need a scolder. That's amazing. She was, she was like, I need to know what happens. Are you going to send this to me or not? And and then she would also immediately tell me, it, it helped me not to entrench my errors because if I had gotten something historically wrong, she immediately told me. But it meant that I that I had to show stuff pretty fast after I had written it. But it, in the, I mean, that was enormously useful. It was enormously yeah. useful. I mean, I imagine that wasn't something that you were used to doing, no? Showing something immediately after you'd written it? Um, I am maybe, I don't do it that much, but I mean, I didn't, it wasn't so much that I minded it, but she was like such, she's such an avid reader and she's such a smart reader that it was just yeah. like, she was also so happy to get them this. So that was, it was not only the scolding. It was also like the encouragement that was in the scolding of kind of like, I like, you know, she wanted to read it and, um, and she took a lot of time out of her life to do that. And, and she was also extremely particular. And all of that was a huge compliment. Oh, that's amazing. I love that you had the scolder. I'm delighted. I'm delighted that you had the scolder and that this book has come to us now. We are, in fact, out of time. Um, but thank you so much. For thank you so much for doing this with me. And thank you so much wow. to the Asian American Writers Workshop and everyone who came onto the internet tonight. Thank you both so much for an amazing conversation. We really appreciate it. And thank you all so much for coming and 
submitting your questions and joining us in this conversation. Congratulations, uh, Sugi, on a fantastic book. We're wishing you, you and Mira all the best. Thank you so much. Thanks all. Have a great night.